Welcome back. Um, we are now going to have a session which follows very um, well on from the keynote that uh, the fabulous keynote that Chris just gave us um, with lots of um, things to think about. Um, there was a lot of conversation about what we do about uh, correcting the literature whether there have been honest mistakes or um, fraud committed. And this session is going to, to look at that. Uh, we have an hour, it's a big topic, so I will try not to talk very much um, because I want to let my fabulous panelists talk. So we have today, we have um, a really lovely panel. Um, as Chris talked about, we need to work together and we need to have all the different stakeholders in the, um, the, the, the process work together to, to solve the problems. So we have uh, Professor Jennifer Byrne, um, who I will discuss each of these bios in a moment, but Jennifer is as um, uh, Chris, described a sleuth and she um, is, has been very involved in in bringing to our attention a lot of the issues um, in the literature including um, the problems of paper mills. Elizabeth Moylan is a research integrity uh, manager, a senior research integrity manager at Wiley and Mark Hooper is a uh, research ethics and integrity manager in a university and so between them they're going to talk from different perspectives about the problems we're facing. Um, just before I go any further, um, the, the same housekeeping as always, all attendees will be muted and cameras will be switched off and we are recording the meeting. Um, but we are very, very keen on having your questions, and we've left a, a reasonable amount of time at the end, um, to the, the last third of the session, for questions and answers. So we do encourage you to put your questions into the box and to upvote uh, your questions um, or other people's questions so that we can see which ones are the most popular. Um, we think, judging by the last session, there'll be a, a lot of questions on this one. Um, so, yes, just a little bit more about participants. Jennifer Byrne is Director of Biobanking um, with NSW Health Pathology and Co-Joint Professor of Molecular Oncology at the University of Sydney. Um, and she leads the Publication and Research Integrity in Medical Research Group. And she'll be talking about her experience and her her belief in the need for change of get trying to get the the literature corrected. Elizabeth is a senior manager research integrity and public ethics at Wiley's research integrity uh, and publishing ethics team, and Mark is uh, plays a leading role in the delivery of policies, guidance, training, and support services at the Queensland University of Technology. And thank you, Mark and Jennifer too, for staying up so late. Um, I have spent uh, all my career in um, research publishing and now concentrate on working on publishing ethics and integrity. Um, and I'm a trustee of COPE. So um, I, I, I really want to, um, move forward to ask the panel some questions. So can I ask you to turn your videos on? I can't see Elizabeth, but that may be just my screen. I'm going to stop sharing now. There we are. Okay, so um, first of all, um, what we're going to do, so we, the, the session is going to look at how we um, how we can correct the literature more rapidly, better the processes, how we can make it less of a 
a problem, as was discussed by Chris, in terms of um, helping people to do the right thing. Um, how we can work together better, how we can change the processes. And so I'm going to start by asking the panel each a couple of questions and then we'll turn it over to, to your questions. Um, so the question I want to ask each of you is, what do you see as the problems with the current system of post-publication corrections? And can I ask Jenny to answer that question first? Oh, thank you, Deborah. Um, I suppose uh, very briefly, I think that the current system is uh, not really fit for purpose in terms of um, its capacity to deal with new challenges such as uh, paper mills. Um, so paper mills uh, are, uh, I suppose, you know, they're not particularly well understood, but what seems to be a character characteristic feature of paper mills is their capacity to operate at scale and with speed. And in this sense, they're very unlike um, genuine research that tends to be, um, you know, very slow, expensive and, and difficult. So um, I don't know, Deborah, I can give some outline, you know, in terms of my background in this field. Is that what you're, you're looking for? Yeah, in about five minutes or something, is that okay? Yeah, okay, so yeah, so just, yeah, I'd just like to thank Deborah and, um, and cope for the invitation of joining you today and also um, Chris for his great introduction into this topic in the plenary session. So um, I also thought it would be a nice thing to recognize today that um, you, you can see I'm wearing a t-shirt with the nucleotides of DNA on them and um, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded jointly to Catalan Carrico and Jude Weissman for their discoveries that enabled effective mRNA vaccines. And I think it's exciting to think about the contributions of basic science to, um, to well-being. And I think particularly in the context of a topic here where we're talking about less sort of positive topics. So yeah, my career has been as a cancer researcher. I've studied protein coding genes in cancer. Um, I started studying cancer largely by chance, um, but I think it was my experiences of having a parent diagnosed with cancer at a young age that made me sort of stick with it. Uh, so my mother um, survived her first cancer diagnosis and her second and her third, but she didn't survive her fourth. And so this meant that cancer cast a long shadow over her life. And unfortunately, this is true for many people. So experimental science is difficult. Uh, it's a tough career choice. It's hard, it's slow, it's expensive. And I stuck at this for a long time, but I think a turning point for me was when I started to read what I found to be very repetitive papers um, that showed very similar figures and formatting and that seemed to lack the strong research justifications that are typical of research um, that is difficult and expensive and slow. I then realized that some of the key reagents in these papers were wrongly identified, which is a bit like having errors in a phone number. If the phone number is wrong, you will either call somebody else or you won't get anybody who picks it up. And even though DNA and RNA sequences aren't written in numbers, but in the letters that you can see on my shirt, um, these letters have to be correct or else, um, and there are many ways that they can be wrong. So we started studying fairly small numbers of papers and the sequences within them, but with the development of an automated tool called Seek and Blast by my colleague Cyril Labbe, we started studying more papers. In 2022, we studied nearly 12,000 papers and we found over 700 with wrong sequences. We believe that this is a very small fraction of the overall problem that exists. We started describing errors in these papers to journals in 2015. And in those early days, we were only corresponding with a handful of journals and these journals largely responded. And we achieved, um, well, achieved is maybe the wrong word, but there were a number of retractions and corrections. We've written about some of these things in the literature. But as we started to strive more papers, it seemed as if um, the response rate declined. And in our most recent paper, um, 18 months after describing papers to journals, we could only see two to 3% of papers that had been acted upon in ways that clearly reflected our concerns. So it's hard for us to know um, why this is happening, but I guess I'm speculating that um, perhaps, uh, you know, journals and uh, publishers are having difficulty coping uh, with the numbers of papers that are perhaps being described. And from my experience, it seems as if the system for then 
investigating errors is too bespoke, uh, particularly the requirement to contact authors before publishing any kind of notice. Uh, I don't think really doesn't work for authors or actors that are not acting in good faith, such as paper mills. Um, from my experience, it seems as if responses can be made at scale when it takes a lot of time and responses can be made quickly when there are a few papers in question. But as I mentioned before, paper mills either individually or collectively operate very quickly and at scale and failing to respond in a similar manner enables the work of paper mills. So I'm now gonna switch my background. Um, where is it? Here it is. Yes, so I'm now gonna show a, um, so this is a picture from the laboratory where I now work. This is taken outside a liquid nitrogen room. Liquid nitrogen rooms are common features of many kinds of laboratories and biobanks. Liquid nitrogen is very cold, so it's prone to evaporate. Um, but when it does that and it escapes into the atmosphere, um, it can be very dangerous. So you can see in this slide that there are some monitoring um, systems and some signs that have been put up by our institution, but some that have been put up by the workers themselves. So similarly, the literature can be affected by rising proportions of fabricated papers from paper mills, just as when nitrogen displaces oxygen from the laboratory, leading to workers potentially collapsing and becoming asphyxiated, rising proportions of fabricated papers can cause scientific fields to collapse. These papers are currently invisible to many researchers, and we may only realize that there's too many of them when it's too late. So just like laboratories or workplaces, so is the literature. Millions of researchers go into the literature every day, and unfortunately there are no monitoring systems that tell them about the proportion of dangerous papers within their fields. So in terms of just as this sign that's behind me shows that safety in laboratories is a collaboration between institutions and individuals. I think that we need to share the issue of making post-publication corrections. Pub publishers and journals can instantly flag verifiable errors and researchers can also perhaps put up signs in the literature to warn their colleagues of the dangers that lie ahead. So I'd be happy to go into this in more detail in the discussion. Thank you again. Thank you, Jenny. So I'd now like to ask um, Elizabeth for her answer to the question of what do you see of the, as the problems with the current system of post-publication corrections? Thank you, Deborah, and thank you. It's lovely to be here. And thank you, Jennifer. I want to just start really by thanking Jennifer for all the effort and valuable work she does um, to support research integrity and to bring issues to the attention of journals and publishers. It's absolutely the role of publishers to uphold the integrity of the published literature, and we appreciate the frustrations shared with the speed at which journals uh, react to concerns raised and the time taken to amend a published article. And I think that all publishers on the call, um, in fact, all stakeholders in this space would agree with Jennifer that speed is paramount. I think it's a really powerful message, um, Jennifer, um, about um, placing warning signs in the literature. But I just want to take a few minutes to explain uh, the some of the challenges, perhaps rather challenges rather than problems we face uh, with the current system of post-publication correction and the sorts of issues we look into to, to address that point. Um, so I think the number one challenge remains that this great pressure to publish on researchers is continuing to fuel the rise of systematic manipulation of the publishing process. Uh, we're seeing paper mills and all sorts of ways in which people can subvert the process um, and the sheer increase in volume of cases that, that is bringing. I think that's only set to continue really with the rise of generative AI tools. Um, and it's going to take some time before we can, you know, put measures in place uh, to develop robust and effective uh, measures against that. There are challenges in applying the normal investigation steps that you'd naturally take on a single case to investigations at scale, especially if that involves hundreds of articles across multiple journals. So, you know, when a concern is raised, there are numerous people that we have to talk to to follow up. So, you know, the first thing we'll do is raise this with the journals involved and the academic editors to evaluate the concerns and take them into account. 
the concerns may be completely valid or they may have an alternative explanation. So we try to take a really measured approach and investigate in accordance with COPE guidance and then follow up with the authors and their institutions as necessary, um, especially if there needs to be an institutional investigation. And, you know, follow up can sometimes be challenging for a variety of reasons. I'm sure Mark finds that conversely from the institutional side as well. Uh, so we can discuss that a bit more. Um, once an outcome is reached and we've made a decision about what we're going to do and how we're going to amend a published article, there are further challenges posed by the sort of functional needs, if you will, in terms of coordinating internally within the publisher across various departments. So we might want to get in touch with our editorial colleagues at the journals involved or related journals regarding the specific findings to alert them to this and to put in measures immediately if they're going to be similarly effective. That, that's a sort of, you know, preventing the, the whack-a-mole approach that Chris alluded to in his uh, talk. We might want to discuss with legal colleagues and our colleagues in communication ahead of amendments going live um, and our colleagues in production to publish the appropriate amendments. So I just wanted to uh, sketch that out um, because while it might seem very obvious to the person who's raising the concern what the concern is, we need to take these measured considerations and steps to follow up and that takes time. And I really uh, just wanted to call out Rennie Hock's blog, um, uh, where she shared PLOS's perspective from last year. Uh, and I thought really sort of summarised the issues well, giving a frank conversation about the challenges faced when concerns are raised. I might drop that in our chat and see if we can drop it in the, the main chat. Um, and then finally, again, sort of brought up in the earlier session, the, the sort of language used in terms of uh, industry best practice in this space. So if we we recognize we need to be quick, but we recognize the steps we need to take, if we want to act quickly before we reach an outcome like a retraction, the sort of thing that's available to us from the industry is to post an expression of concern. And that's, you know, really perceived to be quite a punitive step. Um, we don't want to tarnish an author's reputation or an article before we've got all our facts in order. And so, um, you know, talking about more neutral language in terms of amendments, that will be interesting to explore further. So I think I'll stop there and then we can talk about perhaps some of the solutions uh, once we've heard from Mark's perspective. Thank you, Elizabeth. So can I pose the, the same question now to Mark. Sure, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, and thanks for having me on this panel. This is really interesting. And um, let me say that I agree with some of the problems and challenges raised so far. Um, it'll be an interesting discussion. Uh, perhaps I could raise some different ones uh, for variety and because I can offer an institutional perspective. Um, and before I begin, I just wanna say from, um, I work with a great team at QUT, Anne Welsh is our director who leads off our research ethics and integrity and my colleague, Melissa Tate, who's our research integrity officer. And uh, my views might not represent theirs, but they're certainly born out of close collaboration. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I think I'd like to talk to like a brief list of challenging things if I could, but they have this in common, that we're all sort of part of this ecosystem as stakeholders trying to protect the, you know, the scholarly record. And uh, that has certainly gotten more complex in recent years. And I think Jennifer just spoke to the fact that it needs to get more complex still, you know, to evolve at scale. And perhaps I can talk to a family of challenges uh, about how that translates to institutional investigations. Uh, so one way is the concerns themselves, uh, the complaints. I think until recently, only a number of years ago, it used to be that we'd receive concerns directly you know, it might be a member of the public, it might be a researcher, it might be a journal editor, but at any, any rate, they would write to us, send us an email, phone us, use our anonymous system, whatever, um, and we would take the complaint, and if the scope was research integrity, we'd investigate it. Uh, that still happens, of course, it can still happen, but increasingly, we find ourselves uh, finding, about, finding out about concerns in, way, in far more complex ways. So a plausible scenario might be that someone, you know, a researcher, a sleuth, if you like, makes a, a comment on a post-publication platform on PubPeer, let's say. Maybe the journal or the publisher is notified. Maybe some authors are notified, but not others. Maybe other institutions know, and we don't yet know. 
uh, you know, maybe maybe we're the last to know, or maybe we're not the first to know at least. And that certain that complexity is difficult in itself. But it's also, I think, it's worse than difficult. I think it's not always for the best that some of those things occur prior to an institutional uh, investigation. Um, some, sometimes, you know, authors have already sought corrections, perhaps already obtained corrections, when that's not always the best outcome. Um, Marcus and Aransky, I think, made this point in a piece in 2015, where they said, if authors find out first, I'm paraphrasing, if authors find out first, that gives them time to hide their tracks, essentially. Now, I don't, I think I agree with that. I haven't seen evidence of it firsthand. But what I do agree with is a subtler version that a correction can feel like the resolution of the issue before accountability. And so I think that poses a risk to institutions where uh, researchers feel that the matter is resolved following a correction, and yet the matter of accountability has not yet been addressed. Anyway, concerns are, complete, are complex, and that's a challenge. Um, investigations themselves, also much more challenging in the, in the evolving space. Um, the content themselves of investigations can be more challenging. So we obviously follow, we follow Jennifer's work, we follow other sleuths work, we uh, look at problematic paper screener, retraction watch, all of that, and we need that. And increasingly institutions need to learn from this space. But the way they translate to investigations uh, is tricky. I mean, things like, so it seems like paper mill papers, one marker of a paper mill paper or a bad generative AI paper is nonsense citations. You know, they just point to papers that either don't support the claim or way are way out of the field. And that is bad in itself, but it is also sometimes a proxy for some deeper issue of quality that you know that we might need to investigate, and that's hard to do. So, you know, uh, tortured phrases are in a similar a similar boat, I think. Uh, on investigations, just one final point, and I've been thinking a lot about this one recently. Um, there's some really good and interesting work by Susan Garfinkel and colleagues. I think I saw Susan in the chat uh, before. I was published in JAMA this year um, about enhancing partnerships of institutions and journals on these sorts of cases. It's a really good paper. I thoroughly recommend you read it. Um, one of the recommendations it makes is a call for institutions to uncouple considerations about reliability from considerations about, say, culpability or accountability. And the idea, I think, is that institutions could report to journals the issues of reliability long before they resolve any investigation about say culpability and this is a good goal it's a goal i support um i want to make that clear but i am about to engage with it critically in the sense that it's very difficult um i think facts and values are not two things that you know when it comes to investigations just can't be uncoupled they're often very tightly woven together so perhaps we could communicate that we have concerns about data but if the journal editor asks why we might have to tell them, well, because we think the data is missing or and a researcher really should have retained it. To explain any fact about reliability, we'll often have to give a fact about culpability. And that's the very thing that's ongoing and the thing that's supposed to be uncoupled. Or perhaps, you know, we think this figure, we, we state that this figure is unreliable. And if anyone asks why, well, maybe we have some preliminary evidence that a collaborating institution has tampered with it or something like that. So they're tightly woven together. Um, that doesn't mean I don't support the goal. In fact, I do. I just insist that they're not two things that can be uncoupled, but perhaps things that are tangled that institutions might strive to untangle, you know, to promote quicker retractions. Um, very lastly, I just say that I think there are some cases in which untangling them uh, is not always best. I think institutions have an important role in accountability, and that comes with procedural fairness. And you made the point, Elizabeth, that there's this stigma attached even with um, expressions of interest, I think. And that's that's true as a fact. Perhaps it's a stigma we could try to overcome, but it, ex it certainly exists. And as long as that's true, if institutions sort of ask for those, you know, raise those expressions of concern or suggest them to editors, that seems like it might be jumping the gun if the facts of the matter are still being investigated. So all of that, you know, just some challenges, challenges worth addressing. Perhaps we can talk about them. Great, thank you. Um, certainly there are a lot of challenges and um, and now actually we get to um, to look at the uh, the answers. So I, I next question, my next question is what changes would you like to see implemented to make things better? 
And while you're talking about those, each of you, um, you might want to think about the questions that were asked at the end of Chris's keynote um, about changing terminology, about preprints, um, about whether there is a burden on the author um, to, or there should be a burden on the author to, to tell us whether the paper has been submitted before. Um, so let me go back to Jenny to answer that question about the what changes you'd like to see implemented to make things better. Thanks, Deborah. I think um, we've we've proposed these things um, in the past with uh, with my colleague Yana Christopher, who I think is on who's part of the next session. We've talked about the possibility of flagging um, through neutrally worded notices, such as an editorial note. Uh, errors that are verifiable. So these are errors that essentially can be identified by one individual and verified by almost anybody else. Um, and they could be flagged uh, with very neutral wording um, before institutional um, investigations start or complete. Um, we've also thought about expanding capacity for post-publication correction through PubPeer. Um, we, I could envisage, um, and I've talked about this through my with my colleagues at PubPeer about having a subset of notices that are around verifiable errors that are signed by individuals that could then appear within the literature um, such that researchers can find those notices directly where, the, where, where they're finding the literature that they're reading. So um, essentially, you know, expanding that capacity for researchers to put notifications in the literature about things that um, they're concerned about. So I realise that these are potentially big changes, but on the other hand, again, if we're talking about paper mills, I think we have to realise that paper mills are probably pretty ruthless organisations. They will exploit almost anything to produce papers. They will exploit human cancer. Um, I think expecting that um, paper mills will react in a, a kind of a reasonable way is, is, is probably unrealistic. And I think we have to take a harder line to make sure that the literature which is being produced by scientists to benefit people um, is protected. Can I ask you a, a, an unscheduled question, Jenny, which is, um, rem it reminds me um, when, when the question is asked about preprints, we've talked before about um, people having to publish protocols and then have a reasonable amount of time before their protocol, after their protocol for, to publish their paper, because if they're actually doing the research, it will take them some time. Could you talk a little bit about that and whether, whether you think it's a worthwhile thing to pursue? Yeah, and we had, we had proposed that as well, um, particularly for experimental science, which is very slow. We'd proposed a system where uh, researchers could um, be required to pre-register their study. And this could be very simple. So pre-registration is generally considered to be, a well, it's a way of disclosing exactly what you're doing so that that can be possibly reviewed before the final study is completed. In this version, I think it would just be a way of really it's about traceability to say that, you know, we're a group of researchers, we're working on this thing and we were here a year in advance and we were working on it then. And having that kind of pre-registration could be a requirement to submit a manuscript uh, later. And it would be really important that that pre-registration would happen at least a year in advance um, to sort of really discourage the very rapid generation of paper mill manuscripts um, where additionally, the manuscript is probably generated independently of, of the authors. So while paper mills could possibly have a list of manuscripts a year in advance, they would have a hard time having a list of authors that would go with them. So that was something that we had suggested, you know, again, thinking about how genuine research happens, it happens really slowly, let's embrace that and let's make that the norm and let's reward that. And in doing so, we'll discourage the very rapid, um, generation of content that is you know much more dubious thank you and thank you for putting up with my unscheduled question so <laughs> elizabeth 
Um, can I ask you what changes you would like to see implemented to, to make things better? Yes, of course. And I think these are a number of levels and I would completely agree with Jennifer on um, the, the sort of drive to promote open research initiatives because that does make it harder to fake findings and it does mean that time and effort is put in and you can, you know, showcase your work and what you've done and it's credible and that goes um, not only for researchers but for publishers as well. So, you know, data sharing, transparent peer review, all those initiatives as well. But I think we probably need to just take it back a step and just bear in mind that um, we need to keep addressing the bigger picture. So what we're talking about is some of the symptoms and things that we can do uh, in reaction to these things. But what can we do to address the, the root causes? And it reminds me of um, something Ginny Barber once said when she was chair of COPE. And she was talking at the World Conference on Research Integrity back in 2017, um, describing these sort of wicked problems. And she didn't mean they were wicked um, because they were necessarily evil, but they resist easy solutions. And I think that sort of description of a wicked problem can also apply to the, the paper mill scenarios we're seeing today. Um, so as well as trying to address the, the root causes and uh, reward, you know, that sort of cultural change and rewarding people, as Jennifer just said, for responsible research practice and open research practice rather than the number of publications they've got in a journal, mandating open research initiatives, we also need to come back to that question of speed that Jennifer brought up and really invest in resources. So uh, this is about dedicated integrity teams at publishers with the staff and resources to do this work. Um, that's something that Wiley is grappling with uh, currently, and we are building a new integrity assurance and case resolution team with dedicated staff to do this work. There is an absolute role for collaboration, as Chris emphasised in his talk, and the efforts of COPE and the SDM Integrity Hub here are going to be really key uh, in not only sharing information about screening techniques, but sharing information about the bad actors that we may see so we don't just push the problem elsewhere. And then, you know, this we're still catching up with paper mills and the revised approaches and training we all need in terms of recognizing these issues and handling investigations at scale. So it's been really helpful to see recent practical guidance come from COPE on tackling systematic manipulation at scale and the sorts of evidence you can build. So the sort of um, hallmarks or warning signs and the thresholds that you can be comfortable with so that you know you can act. And I know um, colleagues at Hindawi have definitely developed a rubric to help with coping with mass retractions at scale. So a combination of manual and data driven approaches to identify potentially compromised articles at a quicker pace to keep up. And then, as, as uh, I think was already said, you know, we don't need to necessarily ask authors for an explanation when we can see quite clearly what's gone on. We can uh, share what we've found, not all the details, uh, and, and act. Um, and we can talk just with the corresponding author, for example, to, to cut down on some of that communication and really take a uniform approach with retraction notices. Again, again, this speaks to that kind of neutral approach and focus on the manipulation of the process rather than any author wrongdoing, which we just can't get at or determine. Um, I think another solution is more inclusive publishing um, practices um, and having you know not only promoting diversity equity and inclusion on editorial boards because it's good to promote inclusivity in itself but that allows more eyes and perspectives on things um, and it can catch more issues and then I think perhaps we can talk a little bit more about um, this idea of uh, notes so it, it, it is something, and I think this is really, it'd be really interesting to hear about other people's experience in this space uh, on the call. I think it's definitely the case that where we can, uh, you know, 
it does seem the concerns are well founded from an editorial perspective, but there does need to be an institutional investigation. They're the cases where Wiley has certainly used a note rather than an expression of concern just to share that information and flag it. Um, and then we, of course, you know, that has to be on the version of record that has to go to PubMed, Web of Science, and then we have to commit to updating that when we know what's happened. Um, so it might then lead to an expression of concern, it might lead to a retraction, it might lead to another note saying everything's fine. Um, but the thing there is again, applying that at scale to a paper mill situation, we might argue that, well, if we're doing the investigation, perhaps let's wait for it to be complete rather than issue a sort of interim note in the meantime. But I totally uh, get what Jennifer is saying about wanting the alert. So it'd be good to see what people think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Some, some excellent thoughts there. And now can I turn the same question over to Mark? What would you like to see happen? Sure, yeah, I'm kind of lost in these thoughts that the others have raised. Um, I pick up on something, which is I really like this. I, I like uh, a couple of things we've been talking about. One is that researchers themselves obviously increasingly have a part to play, sleuths, in invest in finding all these things out and, and making good statements about correcting the record. And it would be good if we could connect the published papers to them in a way that just made it easier for scholars to engage with them. Um, I'm going to tell a quick historical anecdote, which I hope you'll forgive me if I make a practical point. So <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I got very interested in the history of peer review practices, including post-publication peer review, and very a very long period of time, long before the first journals in the 17th century. And as part of that, there's a practice called scolia, which I think many of you will know is comments in the margin, essentially. And they're as old as Homeric scholarship, the ancient Greece. Scholars make you know, matters of interpretation or criticism in the margin. But there's a, a cool historian, I think, Kathleen McNamee. She noticed a deliberate publishing practice in the fourth to sixth centuries where these publications of Latin literature were deliberately printed with wider margins to facilitate those comments, right? And the writers would write their comments in the margin. And here's the crucial bit. When the scribes reproduced them, they would reproduce them with those explanatory or derogatory comments in the margin, right? And that's, 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 that's what we're talking about now, I think. I think there's something to learn from history, that it's useful to a reader on getting a scholarly work to see what other people have said about it. And um, many of the problems, too, that people raise with it have also been encountered. I won't go on and on, but, you know, there's these nice examples in the medieval period of, you know, a scholar going on rants about their own work. There's one scholar who calls a, you know, calls a story pure trash in the comment which is sadly relatable post-publication commentary. But you know the world has seen these problems before. But anyway, I promise to make a point. I think that's, I agree, that's what we need. Some system that does that. Um, in part, I think because an expression of concern is too low a bar to do the job. An expression of concern is a judgment in some part on the part of an editor or journal. And what we want is something like something that says a concern has been expressed which is not an expression of concern. So I wonder if there's an opportunity to expand our taxonomy of all the post-publication ways of talking about papers and link them, to a, link them to a paper. I know other people have already done good work in this space. Chris started talking about it before, but I know that there's like a Finelli paper about expanding the taxonomy of retractions and what have you. But I wonder if that, I mean, it basically still deals with the same space from expression of concern through to retraction and just cuts that up into pieces. I wonder if what we need is a wider taxonomy that includes things read by researchers, perhaps things made by institutions, but relates to the whole critique of post-publication peer review. So I don't know, those are some thoughts. Thank you. I, lo I love your uh, description of the um, of the of these practices that have been there forever, because I think that's something that we need to remember when we're talking about these things which is that the the endeavor of research is is an iterative process and that you don't you know things will not always be right and things do need to be corrected and things do need to be built upon and and that's that's what we're doing i do want to encourage everybody um to to 
to put some questions in the chat. I think maybe uh, everyone asked all their questions of Chris earlier rather than um, saving them for this session. So um, I, I would like um, to, to encourage the audience to, uh, to, to ask a few more questions. Um, but um, just going back to, um, I think possibly Elizabeth, if, if I may, um, as a publisher, do you, can you see how that idea of um, comments in the margins could be implemented in sort of the digital age? Uh, is that something that you can see being possible in the future? Thanks, Deborah. I think um, we've talked in the past about the concept of the living article, and maybe that's something that we're getting away from here and the the sort of uh, trappings of publishing as we knew it before the internet. <laughs> so um, maybe that's a, an approach, but I think I think we need to get across the idea of permanency. So. Do we want notes that are there and then go, or do we want notes that are there and there to stay, but a further note can happen? Um, and, and it has to be visible to all. So, you know, it, under the current technical constraints, you know, it has to, we don't just want it to be seen on the journal article. We want that to go through to everywhere else, like PubMed and Web of Science. Um, but it, it is happening right now in terms of... Um, notes and expressions of concern so how we facilitate that i think is going to be key thank you um we have just had a, a question which i think follows on very well from that um uh, an anonymous attendee has has said it seems when investigating a publication there emerges a conflict between the investigating bodies dual duties to treat the authors in good faith, innocent until proven guilty, and to defend the integrity of the scientific record. Do these have to be mutually exclusive? Could being transparent about any issues raised and the status of any ongoing investigations be a possible solution? Allow individual readers to make a calculated assessment of the work, rather than just avoiding it entirely in case an editor of, an expression of concern turns into something more serious. In a way, handling a, an ethical engagement in this investigation like an open post-publication review. Um, maybe I'll go, go back to Mark to uh, to comment on that to start with. Sure. Um, so I've had unstable internet connection, by the way. So if I drop out, it's not out of <laughs> not out of um, angst. Um, I like I like the idea of this question. I, I want to live in a world where this works for sure i like the idea of everything being open i think we live in a world where there's definitely stigma attached to even an accusation that is part of procedural fairness we sometimes need to protect researchers from um so i i much prefer the idea that we that i don't think they're mutually exclusive i think we can be transparent um, i think institutions sometimes have privacy obligations that make this impossible and sometimes there are also reasonable uh, just reasons um, for not subjecting people to that openness but I, th I, I don't know I need to think more about it. Jenny as someone who's been um, you know wanting to see this this happen um, how do you how do you answer that uh, problem of uh, the the innocent till proven guilty um, and all of those those questions yeah look i think you're right it is it is tricky but i think we kind of kind of come back to the reality is that mistakes just happen all the time you know researchers make mistakes absolutely constantly and we should just really normalize that so saying that there's a mistake in a paper shouldn't be the end of the world it should just be look there's a mistake here people and that means that the next person, you know, say you're a PhD student and you're reading a paper and you, you're not going to go into the lab and order PCR primers and sit around and spend the next year of your life actually following this up. You know, the, 
I think it's just really about democratizing errors and saying, we all make them, let's talk about them and, and let's all do better research as a result of that, you know? So I do think we get a bit wound up about some of these things. You know, gee, so, well, you know, I make mistakes every day. We all make them. So, so actually we've been focused on process but actually what you're saying is we also need to focus on perception and the way that people treat these things. I think this is a good time to actually mention that um, Chris mentioned the United to Act Summit that, that we held uh, earlier in the year and the fact that we are creating um, an action plan, multi-stakeholder action plan with a number of efforts that we're going to work together to to. to deal with some of these things and there are a couple of uh working groups that will come out of this which will deal with some of these questions that are being discussed here um and one of them will definitely be on sort of education and awareness and that's a, a very good place that we can start looking at how we change the perception of talking about mistakes and another will be on the process of post-publication correction and some of these questions that have been discussed in here. So I, I think we'll make sure that anyone on those working groups has to has to listen to this uh, discussion before they, they start working. Um, we have another couple of questions, one from Jennifer Wright, who says, fraud, deception, misinformation, corruption, defects, malpractice, bad actors, et cetera, are not unique to academic publishing. Do any of the panelists think there are any industries that deal with these challenges well and or what do the panelists think is unique to academic publishing? So who would like to answer that question? I was, wondering, I was just wondering about, um, you know, another problem we face is um, not only with the content of the manuscript, but knowing that people are real and verifiable and where they are. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm not a technical expert um, in terms of innovative solutions here, but the banking industry and, you know, the, the moment you try and do anything, you have to verify it's you. At least that that factors in that you're there and you you exist, right? Because, you know, we do face challenges where we are retracting um, papers where we, we, we can't locate these people. Where are they based? They're made up people. I think that um, speaks to one of the other uh, working groups of the action plan, which will be about trust markers. We know that various um, organizations are working on trust markers. Um, and that I think we, what we want to do is work with them to make sure that those are um, capable of being incorporated and used within uh these sorts of questions and um i think that's very very true it's about making sure we know who it is and that a lot of the um issues to do with with fraud and integrity are about people who who are pretending to be people they aren't um susan garfield asks Post-publication changes are necessary as described by the panel, but what can journals do to make changes for potential prevention by making authors more aware of research ethics when submitting? Um, let me ask uh, Jennifer that question first. Yes, that's a, a good question. Um, Look, I don't know if I'm really the right person to answer this because I'm not somebody who's sort of involved in journals as such. Um, yeah, I think I'd probably prefer for someone else to answer. Maybe Elizabeth. Okay. I'm sorry to be passing the button, but, you know. No problem. It's fine. And I think, um, you know, on submission, we do ask authors a lot of questions um, and we do run a number of checks at that point. I guess there's always the worry that people will just tick a box and lie, um, but at least we're making them think about, you know, uh, have you shared your data? Have you pre-printed this somewhere? Uh, 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 have you discussed authorship or, or these kind of questions? Um, but I, I, I'd love to see us, and I think this is again, part of the work that the Research Integrity Hub can do, 
give us all some standard text that all publishers that are part of this endeavor can say and are you happy that if we find anything questionable about your manuscript we share it <laughs> with the research integrity hub so that we all you know that's a, again a sort of warning sign isn't it that if we find anything we will share it and you've given us permission to do that thank you mark do you think there's anything that as well as journals uh educating uh, researchers that universities should be doing um and research institutes should be doing to help uh educate researchers or before they submit their research yeah absolutely i think there's always room for better education i think um i know that one thing qt has strived to do in the space of education is to link content about publication integrity um, and publication ethics with its content uh that helps say younger researchers learn how to publish and where to publish so it mixes the practice of uh you know skills-based training about publication with training specifically about the integrity of publishing on the um just pick up on something elizabeth was talking about when it came in from a publisher's perspective i i'm aware of specifically with plagiarism i'm aware of a perception by some people it's very strange to me that since publishers you know or journals do say plagiarism checks it is therefore no longer the responsibility of the author. You know, it's like the it's as if the publisher's taken that on. And that's obviously false, but I'm aware that people believe this. So I wonder if there's any way to dispel that kind of misconception, for instance. I think that goes back to education and awareness again. And I think that the key theme that comes out whenever we have these conversations is how much more education and awareness on all aspects of um research ethics, uh, publication ethics, and what is misconduct um, is, is needed. Um, also, not only for the authors, but also for editors and reviewers to, to be aware of stuff that goes on so that they can look for it when they're, when they're looking at papers. Okay, so we have uh, another question here from Maria, Maria Zahn, who says, when talking about larger publication ethics issues, such as paper mills and systematic manipulation of the peer review process, it's relatively easy to argue for quicker notices and public comments. However, as an editor within a dedicated publication ethics team, we also see a lot of concerns that have no merit, either because the reader has misunderstood the article or because there are ongoing feuds between research groups, harassment by specific individuals, or general anti-science groups that are trying to deliberately raise doubt with scientific articles or on controversial topics. When we are discussing approaches to assessment of cases, we should keep in mind that there is not always merit to the concerns and, auth and authors do deserve a fair assessment before any public notices are issued. And it's a very, very good point. Thank you, Maria. Um, any comments? That any of you would like to make on that before we move on? Maybe just quickly. I mean, I think that is a really important point. I mean, I'm a big fan, before you change anything, is trying a pilot. And I've always thought that, you know, perhaps the first thing to, you know, certainly recognise that, yes, you know, people can make comments for all sorts of reasons, and some of them are, you know, not about things that other people would necessarily agree with. But perhaps piloting this kind of system with a journal in a relatively non-controversial issue might be a way of sort of working out what actually happens on the ground if you do open post-publication commentary up. Uh, certainly the comments to the award of the Nobel Prize today on Twitter were a very dramatic indication of how different groups of people can view the same event <laughs> in very different ways. But, you know, piloting, I think, is, you know, doing a trial of something and seeing, you know, what does happen in real life when we actually start this um, might be a way forward. Thanks, Jenny. So um, I think we have time for one more question. And we have one more question. Um, if a submitted manuscript has ethics integrity issues and gets rejected, since journal publishers do not, and maybe even cannot report it, the manuscript gets published elsewhere. 
Are there any mechanisms to, pre to prevent this from happening? Can publishers at least alert the Institute? Um, Elizabeth, maybe you could answer that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and I also grapple with some of Maria's points where she said about the need for a thorough investigation. Um, so I think Cope Guidance will say that if you do um, find ethics and integrity issues, then you shouldn't reject it. Um, in fact, you should you should follow up on that with the authors and their institutions so the institution knows and that it can see what's happened before it's rejected. So maybe that's the way and yeah, absolutely alert the Institute. And there is one more question that's just arrived and we do have a few more minutes. So uh, it's a question, when an article is corrected or retracted, it's standard practice that the original remains published with usually a watermark and a warning. With more and more wholesale data article fabrication, plus the growing open access of these papers to the general public, should this be reconsidered? What is the point of keeping demonstrably fabricated data online where non-scientists can stumble across it and be misinformed. Who would like to, this a, it's quite a large question to, um, to discuss in a short time. So um, any, any reflections on that, any of you? I guess as long as it's clearly marked then and, and signposted as retracted, then hopefully that's the biggest help we can have. Uh, and people can see that. So we're being transparent about it rather than removing it. <laughs> there are cases for withdrawal or removal, you know, if, if for some particularly egregious concern or lack of consent. But again, if the paper is taken down, then the, the article notice will remain so that you can still see what's happened. I think I'd add that uh, once a paper has been published, and especially with open access, it's out there, you need to have um, something marking the fact that there is um, a problem with the paper because it's impossible to remove it from the internet completely. You can remove it from the site it was first published, but it will be out there. So if it is referred to, there needs to be somewhere that make sure that um, that we can do something about that. Okay, um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you very much indeed um, to the panelists. That's been a great discussion. I think some of the issues that we have uh, discussed in this session will be will come up again during the rest of the week uh, and the rest of today. In fact. Um, so thank you very much for to to each of the panelists. Thank you to all the all the questions from the audience. And um, we now have, I think, a short break before the next session, which is on um, image manipulation. Um, and I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. <laughs>